Around a million people graduate medical school in the world each year. Of this, about 70,000 come from India, 20,000 from the US, 8,800 from UK, and 2,200 from Canada. So about 10% of all doctors graduating in the world comes from these four countries. But multiple studies are now emerging that shows a rising number of cases in depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, burnout, and suicide. One study reports that one physician dies by suicide each day, but why? Hey friends, my name is Noble. I'm a medical doctor, entrepreneur, and a coach with an interest in lifestyle medicine. And on this channel, I discuss various evidence-based natural ways to live a healthier life. I also help young adults looking to either enter medicine or those that are already in medicine find their true purpose, be it within a hospital or outside of it. So are you looking to go to medical school to become a doctor soon? If so, then we have two stages that we need to look at for a better understanding of what you might be signing up for. First, we have the stage before entering medical school and the second stage is after graduating medical school. Let's start with our first stage. Before going into medical school, we have a few questions to answer. First one, do you fully understand what the life of a doctor is like and what the trade-offs are? Second one, are you going into medical school because of family pressure or because some of your smart friends are going to medical school? Third one, do you feel like this is a profession that will make you rich and famous? Fourth one, are you making the right choice after considering all the factors involved? What are these factors? Factor number one, competition. Students need to undergo extremely competitive placement exams like the NEET in India, MCAT in the US, UCAT or BMAT in the UK. Between 85 to 95 percent of students who try to apply to medical school after these tests don't get through. So you need to be in the top 5 to 10 percent of the batch of students in that applying year to make it. Factor number two, cost. In the US, the average student debt after going to medical school is 250,000 US dollars. In the UK, it is 95,000 US dollars and in India, it would be between 3,000 US dollars for an Indian national getting into medical school on pure merit and 125,000 US dollars for private medical college admissions. With a very small interest rate of 5%, we are looking at a 50% additional cost in just interest payments over the next 10 years, which is by when you would start making enough money to pay this back. That is no small chunk of change and the loans on these amounts spread over an 8 to 10 year period will quickly add up. Factor number three, time. In the US, you have a pre-med program before you get into medical school. So the duration is about eight years. In the UK, you get in after school and you finish your undergraduate in about six years and then you go through a two-year foundation program before going into specialty training. So you again need about eight years. In India, you get into medical school straight after your final year of school and takes about five and a half years, which includes a one-year internship. So you become a fully licensed doctor in 5.5 years. Then you can get into a postgraduate specialty and be a specialist in three years. So in the US and UK, you become a foundation doctor in eight years. In India, you become a postgraduate specialist doctor in 8.5 years. By the way, all these numbers don't account for any time that you might lose in between due to intense partying, gaming, or substance abuse. Come on. We all know what happens in university, right? So let's say we consider all these factors and you decide to go to medical school. This is where the answer to those initial few questions will begin to unravel. But by then, it will be too late. So this is in part a journey into the future to see what life is like as a medical doctor. Back to the timeline. You now spend more than half a decade and get through medical school and become a freshly minted doctor. You start with hopes of saving a billion lives and changing the face of healthcare. Your second stage starts here. But as you start working, you quickly begin to realize that you have just entered one of the most regulated, hectic, low-tech industries to exist. Yes, it is an industry, but every profession caters to some industry or the other, and medicine is no exception. You start to see that there are more hurdles ahead and trade-offs to be made. The first hurdle you're going to face is getting into higher medical training, residency, or postgraduate studies. Today, the requirement for for a well compensated post in medicine often requires specialization and getting into higher specialty training for subjects like orthopedics, radiology, dermatology, ophthalmology, etc. is very hard. It is doable, but you are now competing with an even more intensive group of candidates. After all, everyone in this level is in the top 10% of graduates nationally. So be ready to settle for a specialty that you are not very interested in if things don't work out. Hurdle number two, work-life balance. Long story short, there is no such thing as work-life 
balance in the world of medicine. At least not till you become a consultant almost 10 years after you graduate medical school. This is not a nine to five job in most cases. Your working hours will be long. The learning and adjustment curve is very steep as you are dealing with life and death scenarios. You cannot take a break and go think about a problem in your own time. You need to deal with matters then and there. If you happen to go into emergency medicine, this will be magnified many fold. Be ready for night shifts, 24 to 48 hour on calls, community visits and long clinics as a result of which your family or friends won't be seeing much of you for a while. Hurdle number three, the constant stress. Till you finish your medical school, you have exams and multiple assignments. You can say you will still have some relative time to enjoy university life at this stage. But once you finish medical school and get into higher specialty training or residency, things get worse. Besides your daily stress in the hospital, you have a target number of cases or procedures to complete each year. You have logbooks to maintain and also need to write up case studies and research papers. You need to do numerous reflective reports on cases you attend and get them reviewed by your assigned supervisor. You have multiple exams to ensure you are up to date and competent. So if you are not able to stay organized and compartmentalize your work from your personal life, this can seriously affect your mental health and physical health. The other point here is that the stakes are always high. You are dealing with human lives and the loss of a life by your action or inaction is very hard to deal with emotionally. As opposed to let's say messing up a line of code as a software engineer, causing inconvenience to a few team members. So always consider that along your journey. Fourth hurdle that you're going to come across and something very important for medical graduates from any non-Western country like India, Pakistan, China, and the African Middle Eastern countries is the lack of recognition of degrees between countries and the narrow scope of moving between industries. Your undergraduate medical degree is not valid for practice in any country other than the one you obtained it from. Whereas in courses in engineering, accounting, management, etc., you have multiple recognitions across Western countries and there are mutual agreements in place between professional bodies that will help you transfer credits and switch to their system easily. In medicine, you have licensing exams that are as good as repeating your undergraduate degree to be part of their system. If you happen to go so far as to complete your postgraduate degree from a non-Western country, then you have just lost those years because none of the postgraduate qualifications are valid in the US or Canada. In the UK, if you have documented logbooks of your cases while doing your postgraduate training in your home country, you have an alternate pathway by applying for a membership at one of the royal colleges like MRCP, MRCS, MRCGP, etc., which can help your licensing easier, but this is not a very straightforward process and can take time. At an undergraduate level, if you are looking to move to the UK, you need to finish your PLAB 1, PLAB 2, and then you become a fully licensed doctor in the UK, which can take up to a year to complete. In the US, you need to do your USMLE Step 1, Step 2 CK, which is clinical knowledge, then Step 2 CS, which is clinical skills, and then Step 3. And then if you happen to score well about 90 percentile, note that it is percentile and not percentage, which means you again need to be in the top 10% of the applicants. Then you stand a small chance of getting into residency. The same process is applicable for getting into Canada as a resident. This process can take 1.5 at best to three years to complete, and you are practically repeating your undergraduate degree in the US Canada format to get into their system. And the system is very different. US, Canada, UK, and the Australian medical systems emphasize a lot on bedside manners and your approach to diagnosing a condition rather than how well you can memorize all your medical textbooks. So if you have poor communication skills, then you can forget about this path. The stories are true. There are plenty of foreign medical graduates working as Uber drivers, gas stations, attendants, insurance agents, and post office workers in Western countries. Not that these professions are bad, but you just don't need to do a medical degree for them. So these people just couldn't make it into the system. The opposite is also true where there are multi-millionaire physicians who trained in a foreign medical school. For ones that are very sure about their medical career and is confident that they have the skills and knowledge, it might be worth it as the pay for doctors are the best in Western countries. Or even better if you head to countries like UAE or other GCC countries after doing a Western medical residency. Speaking about pay, that's a hurdle number five. Contrary to what most people think, the pay for a doctor is not very great considering all the workload, time, and stress that is involved until you get to a super specialist level. Now, if you factor in debt for the studies that you just finished, you will be taking home much less. The median salary for a doctor in India is just 1,100 US dollars or about 87,000 Indian rupees per month. 
That's 13,000 US dollars per year. This might sound as a big shocker for people in countries like the US and UK, but the living costs are proportionally lower in India, hence the difference. Of course, many doctors make way more than this in a year and many doctors make way less. So this is just an average figure. In the UK, the average yearly pay for a mid-level doctor is 55,000 US dollars or 44 lakh Indian rupees, nearly four times more than what you make in India. But do note that after tax, your cost of living is significantly higher, so you won't be saving much at this rate. Coming to the US, the average resident makes about 68,000 US dollars a year or 55 lakh Indian rupees. But things start to take a very dramatic change in terms of your pay after residency. In India, you can get an average of 60,000 US dollars after many years of experience. In the UK, you are looking at upwards of 145,000 US dollars, but then tax really eats into your salary. In the US, you are looking at upwards of 250,000 US dollars as a specialist. The difference in pay is just enormous. The numbers speak for itself and I don't need to stress any more in terms of where it might be best for you to live as a doctor. Moving on to our sixth hurdle, the opportunity cost. Medicine is an extremely protocol and systems based non-creative job. You have your pathways of management for each condition. You have your best practices and you have your evidence based studies that you need to stick by. You can't have an idea and go test it out on a patient. Even for doing a research study, you need approvals from multiple authorities including an ethics committee to get started. And this is for a very good reason because you are dealing with human lives here and a mistake is not an option. But you might be a very creative talent person in many other things. Maybe you're good in design, maybe you're a good entrepreneur, a good media personality, an engineer, an artist, a finance professional, a negotiator. If you happen to be in a hospital or team that fosters innovation, you are in luck and there is some chance of creative exploration. But otherwise, no one wants to hear about your other talents or pursuits. Speaking about parallel pursuits in other fields might make you look less dedicated to your profession and your patients. You simply might not have the time and energy to pursue anything else after such a stressful day at work. And you have to stay dedicated for a long time, which brings us to our seventh hurdle, time. By the time you finish your higher specialty training, you are looking at your mid-30s for most average doctors. By this time, your friends in tech, finance, engineering, or even that friend who never studied in school but decided to start his own business because he's a good communicator, a good talker, would be living in their mansions with their partner, kids, and a golden retriever. Whereas you could be on the brink of divorce and just managing to pay off your debt. I was expecting to find high divorce rates among physicians in my research for this video, but apparently it is not that high. The average is about 25% as per this article in the BMJ. But I did find that it is double the amount among psychiatrists in this study right here. I guess it is never a good idea to psychoanalyze your spouse. Moving on to our eighth hurdle, interacting with people. Medicine is one profession where you need to constantly adjust your communication methods. You need to learn how to break bad news to a patient and to their families. You need to learn to present a case to a senior doctor. You need to learn to teach medical students. You need to learn to communicate with often frustrated allied health professionals. There is a lot of ego between specialists within the same hospital. Sometimes you are going to play the role of a back and forth messenger. Neither of them would want to concede. After all, they are specialist titans. The situations are endless and a miscommunication can cost you a lot, including your license to practice. In many Asian countries, there are multiple incidents where a mob attacks a doctor or a hospital by no fault of the doctor. Now the vice versa is also true where a doctor does not do their job leading to medical negligence and the loss of a life. Ideally, you have professional bodies to look into this matter and discipline the doctor. But if you happen to be in a country where people take matters into their own hands, best of luck. Ninth hurdle, insurance. This is a profession where your every step will be scrutinized. So you must make sure everything is documented. A patient might make an ill-intentioned or in some cases an apt claim against you. A co-worker might get offended by what you said. You could be a surgeon doing a complicated surgery which might result in the loss of a life. The threat of lawsuits are particularly high in Western countries and that's why you have very expensive medical malpractice insurance in place. And this can really eat into your earnings. Tenth hurdle, admin work, bureaucracy, and low level of technology. A doctor spends more time doing admin work than seeing patients. And this gets worse as you go up in the ranks to director level positions in a hospital. Just to give you an idea, as a junior doctor, you start with a history and examination sheet, which includes present complaints, past history, surgical history, medication history, allergies, personal history, so on and so forth. Then a 
drug chart that lists out all the medications and for patients with chronic conditions, this can be pages long. Then special investigation order forms, special medication order forms, death certificates, discharge summaries, emails to other specialists, documentation of daily rounds and more. Now a lot of hospitals are moving on to electronic systems which are supposed to make things easier but many hospitals are tied up in so many old software systems which don't communicate with newer systems and they end up continuing with these old systems to avoid inconvenience and large costs involved in migrations. So oftentimes you find yourself dealing with systems that were designed in the 80s or 90s. In 2020, I was working in a hospital that considered changing over from Windows XP to Windows 10 and it was advertised as a significant technological milestone for that hospital. Now there are many hospitals that are worse than this and many that have full state-of-the-art hospital management command centers to run patient rounds but the majority are still very behind in the adoption of efficient systems to manage their processes. 11th hurdle, you are at the forefront of the national workforce dealing with all sorts of health hazards. In the west you are what one would call an essential worker which just means that while all the other privileged professionals like lawyers, managers, accountants, entrepreneurs and tech professionals get to work from home, you can't do that. You need to put yourself on the front line and be prepared to face whatever comes your way. Your options, should you choose to accept this profession, are none other than dealing with it. There is no other option and many times you will be told that by your supervisors. On top of this, there is a huge shortage of all sorts of healthcare professionals and you will be expected to make up for that shortage, leading to burnout, depression and mental health issues. This is as real as it can get. At this point, I want to remind you about something. Please don't consider this video as any form of specific direct advice to base your life choices on. Everything I say in this video is from my personal experience for over two decades and is my personal opinion. Many healthcare professionals succeed and thrive very well in the face of any adversity and there are n number of factors like knowing the right people, access to cheap finance, location etc which might or might not favor one's life path. So you are the best person to judge your own circumstances and make your own life choices. I can only tell you what is out there and what someone might not be telling you. It is not all doom and gloom in this profession though. Personally, I found two reasons that kept me focused in medical school and beyond. First, the knowledge. In my school days, I happened to naturally be good at biology, physics, and math. I wanted to be an engineer, just like my dad. But because of family pressure, like most kids from my background, I went into medicine. It was my father's dream. I still remember a very smart trick he used. He always had a way with his words. He told me, son, you want to be an engineer and you want to be the best, right? Tell me, what is the most complex machine in this world? Now, being good at biology and understanding the basics of how the body works, I answered, well, the human body. So my dad said, well, if the human body is the most complex machine in the world, wouldn't you consider a doctor to be the best engineer as well? He had me there at that point. And once I was in medical school, I realized he was right. You are dealing with the most complex machine to exist. I fell in love with the way our inner systems worked and how magnificent our innate healing capabilities were. Secondly, there is no other profession that gives such a unique feeling of respect and purpose. Besides being a doctor, I have had the privilege of being an entrepreneur, a designer, a consultant, and a life coach. But no other profession gives the satisfaction of helping someone with their health. You touch people on a very deep level and the gratitude you get is instantly visible in their eyes. So in the end, I just want to convey a very strong message. Don't go into medicine for your family or friends. Don't go into medicine thinking it is easy. Do it because you are selfless. Do it because you are ready to make sacrifices and you know that this is your role in this life. Don't do it for money and status. Do it because you love people with all their imperfections. And when you do it from a true sense of purpose, you wouldn't have to chase money or status. Money and status will come chasing you. Personally, I believe medicine, and by medicine I mean all forms of it, be it Ayurveda, traditional Chinese medicine, homeopathy, and people who are in education. So being any medical professional and being a teacher has such a high future value of impacting life lives that the work you do really matters. Not just at that moment, but for generations to come. We are in a time where, with all the hardships I mentioned above, well-intentioned, selfless people in healthcare and education are just not being valued enough, increasing workload with decreasing pay. While you are saving many lives and their families, your own family is falling apart. So for all the healthcare professionals and teachers out there, a big salute to you for showing up day after day to make a difference in someone's life. Your work and your life is changing the world for good. It can be a long, hard journey and sometimes you need the support. Feel free to reach out to me at any point of your career if you want some clarity or if you just want
want to talk to someone. You might be trying to stay in medicine and struggling to cope or thinking of leaving medicine. Either way, don't be shy. I'm just a message away. Until next time, take care and I'll see you around.